this afternoon. All right, so I would like to introduce Nick Jarmus. Did Jar I say that? Jarmus, there we go. Um, from AAA, and he kindly offered to come and share the resources and information that are available for seniors as well as individuals with disabilities and just good driving um, tools and what is available. Um, I've actually been a AAA member since my parents gave me the membership when I graduated high school. So I was telling him, I'm, I'm almost excited if I get a flat tire every year because then I'm <laughs> like, oh, I used my membership this year, all right. And then he reminded me of all the other discounts and stuff. So anyway, thank you very much for your My time, pleasure. Nick. And you. uh, we'll let you take it away. Sounds good. Oh, no, please. <laughs> uh, so just uh, to briefly introduce myself and AAA. Um, you know, AAA has been around for over 110 years, um, primarily founded as originally a club for the uh, small hobby of motoring and vehicle uh, automobile driving, which has now become almost everyone in the country uh, is a member of that club unofficially. Although, um, as far as trip, uh, official membership, we have about 60 million members uh, nationwide uh, in AAA. Uh, about 750,000 here in, in the state of Wisconsin. Um, and we've expanded our reach to, to not only talk about um, advocacy issues you know, that affect motorists, but also uh, traffic safety issues uh, such as senior driving um, a as well as offering a, a line of, of products and services to our members, um, notably the roadside assistance that most people know us for, but also insurance and travel services and things like that. Uh, but senior driving is an issue that we've been focusing a lot on in the last 10 years um, for a number of reasons, and actually I'll get into to some of those and be able to illustrate some of those for a while. But um, Within our, our kind of annual priorities that we as, a, as an organization set, uh, senior driving is one of the top four priorities that we have um, because it is becoming such a huge issue uh, and just continues to become a bigger issue um, just based on demographics, which, which again, we'll talk more about those demographics in a minute. Uh, as for myself, I've been with AAA for about 12, almost 13 years now. Um, Working uh, half of that time was spent down in Illinois, and then half of that time was spent up here in Wisconsin, and now I actually work in both states uh, a little bit. Um, so I, I'm a Bears fan, but please don't hold that against me. We're all doing great this year, the whole division. Um, and, and in terms of personal connection to this issue, um, I have two grandparents, or had two grandparents, I should say, uh, who you know went through that process of driving to, to not being able to drive uh, as they aged and it really taught me just how unique each person is uh, when it comes to how aging affects their driving and, and how they um, develop that. And we'll, we'll get uh, touch on that a little bit formally during the presentation as well. Uh, but I had one grandfather who uh, had a stroke um, and was told that you know with the proper amount of rehabilitation would definitely be able to drive again. Uh, but they told him that he wouldn't be able to golf again. And the only place he wanted to drive to was the golf course anyway, so he just said, I'm going to sell my car and not really even worry about it. I had my other grandfather who uh, was diagnosed with Alzheimer's in his early 70s and fought tooth and nail to keep his car, keep his keys, uh, made about 50 different sets of keys for that car over the course of five years. Um, so w when they eventually did get away from him, and I was in college and they actually gave it to me because... I happened to need a car at the time. I got a coffee can full of keys for this car, uh, which was really interesting. So it just shows you how different everyone can be and, and how age affects people differently, but also how people uh, process that transition for themselves and, and how they choose to address it. Uh, but with that all being said, I'll kind of get into the, a little bit of a, a roadmap for what we're going to talk about. First, we're going to look at the numbers, um, the demographics uh, of aging and driving. Then we'll talk about the research that AAA has done primarily through our uh, Foundation for Traffic Safety, which, which does a lot of our research projects for us. Um, and then the, uh, we'll talk about just generally how does aging impact driving and, and what are some of the facts that, that we know in this area. And then finally I'll go over some of the tools and resources that are available from AAA, um, and these are things that, that are not membership benefits, they're not you know, products or services, these are uh, part of our public um, education platform that, that we make available to everyone, tools that are available to everyone, 
uh, to try and uh, keep everyone safer on the road because we know that you know, the issue of senior driving doesn't just affect senior drivers and their family members, it also affects everyone who's sharing the road with those older drivers. Um, and the same is true about any issue. Teen driving, we, that's one of our other top four priorities. Uh, teen driving isn't just an issue for teens and their parents, it affects everyone who's on the road with them. So we'll talk uh, about driving by numbers. This is kind of the stereotypical perception we all have um, of senior drivers. Uh, but this is, you know, now we're in the modern era, you know, being, being old, you know, they say that 40 is the new, or 50 is the new 40, and 60 is the new 30, and, you know, everyone's going to be young forever. We have a whole different idea of what it looks like to be a senior citizen. Uh, and this, this plays into a lot of different issues, not just driving, um, as you know, as folks who work in this arena. Um, this, you know, baby boom generation that is approaching retirement, many of them already in the retirement years, they don't think of themselves as senior citizens. So, you know, whereas historically we've had kind of, you know, three generations at a time at any point in, in, in our history, um, now we have really four generations. You know, you, you have kids, you have adults, and then you had uh, seniors or elders, and now you almost have two generations of seniors or elders coexisting just because people are living longer. Um, and because we're Generally, living healthier lifestyles, we have more resources available to us that, that you know, being 60 uh, in today's world isn't, doesn't look the same as being 60 did, you know, even 15, 20 years ago. But this is what the demographics look like when charted out. Um, we see from, starting from 1900, I know this may be a little hard for, for you to read, starting at 1900 uh, on the far left side, going all the way to 2060 on the far right side. Uh, and we see how that percentage of folks who are over the age of 60 um, ha increases, um, and, and it's just going to continue to increase, largely because of extended life expectancies. So people are, are living longer. Uh, and then there's also issues with, with replenishment birth rates, so the, the percentage of the population that's over that age is actually growing larger as well. Uh, and this kind of illustrates it uh, a little more as well. So the, the yellow bar is 85 plus, the orange bar is 75 to 84, uh, and then the red bar is that 65 to 74. And this chart starts with 1950 on one side and goes to 2050 on the other. Uh, so we're, you know, we're right over here. We're really, we've already, or, or we're on the verge of making this big jump, and, and obviously, you know, these charts are looking by decades, so, so we're closer to, to 2020 already. But, you know, this is one of the big jumps that, that we're seeing right now, uh, especially in that 65 to 74 population. Um, and then we're still going to see those numbers going up, uh, but not as significantly. So the, the reality that we're going to begin to see uh, is largely going to be the situation we'll be dealing with uh, for the next couple of decades. Um, what does it look like in terms of crash involvement? So drivers in their 70s uh, crash about the same rate as drivers in their 30s. Uh, drivers in their mid to late 80s uh, have a lower crash rate than drivers in their early 20s. Um, and drivers in their 80s have a per mile crash rate about half those of teenagers. So we have this perception uh, sometimes, you know, fed by media stories you know, that, that take you know, high profile crashes and, try, and people generalize based on those that seniors are um, you know, dangerous drivers uh, and, and they're not. And, and I always stress when, when AAA makes senior driving a priority, you know, we talk about seniors as being a vulnerable road user population uh, and, and a vulnerable driving population. And it's not for the same reasons as teen drivers. For teen drivers it's because they're so terrible at driving. You know, they're inexperienced. I'm, none of them here that's going to mob me outside. So. Um, they're so inexperienced and, and uh, generally you know, don't have the capacity for good judgment uh, that they tend to get into crashes at extremely high rates. Seniors tend to get into crashes at very, very low rates. But what makes them so vulnerable is the fact that when they do get into those crashes, they are much more likely to be injured and severely injured. Uh, because their, their bodies can't absorb the energy forces of the crash uh, the way a younger person can. 
So to chart this out again, um, this is the blue line is drivers who are themselves uh, killed in crashes, and then the red line is other people outside the ve driver's vehicle. So other people sharing the road with those drivers who are killed in crashes involving senior drivers, um, or excuse me, drivers of that age. And we see you know this dip. You know you start with 16 year olds um, having a, a much higher crash rate. It you know glow, goes down. By the time they get to their mid-30s, you know, they're, they're kind of locked in. They've got the experience they need as drivers. They're exercising better judgment. A lot of times, by that point, they have kids in the car, their kids in the car with them, which, which really changes their driving behavior. Um, and then we see it begin to slowly, very slowly creep up. Um, and then once you get past you know, 70, 75, it starts to jump up. But again, this is in terms of fatalities in crashes, not in the number of crashes themselves. So this, again, speaks more towards the fact that it's not that people on this end of the spectrum are getting into more crashes uh, than people on this end of the spectrum. It's just that people on the left-hand side of the spectrum are more likely to survive crashes when they get into them. So let's talk about some of the research that AAA has done, because uh, that's one of the main things we do around our priority issues. Uh, first and foremost, we put a lot of resources into conducting research projects uh, through our foundation and then using the results of those projects or the information that we learn through those research projects, we were able to develop programs and resources or even just public education and, and advocacy tools. So the first one that I'll talk about is uh, looking at advanced in-vehicle technology uh, for drivers. And this is kind of an overlap area because one of our other priority uh, issue areas that we're looking at in the last couple of years is advancements in vehicle technology and, and how are we coping with the fact that cars are um, technologically evolving at such a rapid rate that you, know, you train someone to drive in a car, you take driver's ed, and by the time you're two or three years out of driver's ed, there's so much new technology built into a car. Well, think about if you took driver's ed in the 1950s or 60s, and now you're driving a car that's constantly beeping at you and you know, um, doing all kinds of things. It has a lot of great resources built into it, but if you don't understand how to use those features and, and say, um, uh, technology, then it sometimes can do more harm than good, um, or at least not as much good as it, it should or could be doing. Uh, so we, we see that older drivers um, have an over-reliance on the rear backup cameras, and part of that is because uh, older drivers tend to have a more difficult time turning their, their upper body to, to physically look behind them. And so these Backup cameras are a great tool for them uh, in that sense. It gives them the ability to see what's immediately behind the vehicle without having to turn their upper trunk to look behind them. But we also know that these rear view cameras have limitations to them. And we always encourage you know, anyone who has one of these cameras in their vehicle not to rely solely on the camera. Well, for seniors um, you know, who are reaping the benefit of the camera, it's, they still have that challenge of, of doing the physical double check um, you know, to manually check it. Um, we know that uh, a significant number of them would purchase vehicles, again, that, that have advanced cruise control, or excuse me, adaptive cruise control, which is one of the most common uh, features. In fact, it's not quite standard uh, on vehicles yet, but, it, but it's rapidly approaching there. Um, about 40% thought that adaptive cruise control made them a safer driver. Uh, and a 43% thought that advanced cruise control would prevent a crash. Uh, and that's the number that's disturbing for us because advanced cruise control does not prevent crashes. Advanced cruise, uh, what adaptive cruise control does is adjust your cruise. So when you set the cruise, there's a little radar that sh shoots out in front of you and you know, kind of locks you into to place. So if the car in front of you begins to slow down, it will automatically adjust your speed to slow you down as well. But what it will not do is if the vehicle in front of you applies its brakes and stops, it will not apply your brakes. All it can do is basically, um, for, for lack of a better term, control the, the accelerator of the vehicle by you know, pushing it down or, or pulling it back. It d doesn't control the brake at all. So you would still have to physically apply the brake yourself 
Uh, but over 40% of the, the seniors that were in this study uh, didn't understand that. And now there are technologies um, that do that. Um, auto braking, you know, and that that's, gets into a whole other can of worms, but uh, you know, as these technologies come out, there's different terms for them. There, there's not as many standard or as much standardization of terminology around them. Um, some of them are proprietary systems, so each brand has their own um, their own name for their system, and, and some of these different systems may do exactly the same thing, and they have very different names. Uh, you also have systems that do not do the same things. They have very similar names to other systems. And so there's a lot of confusion out there. Uh, and so this is something that you know, we, we've been keeping our eye on and, and trying to develop more resources um, and programs to help make sure that seniors understand the technology, uh, and really all drivers understand the technology that's being built into their vehicles so that they don't get into a false sense of security thinking that they have a feature that's going to stop them if the person in front of them stops when actually all it's going to do is slow down. Uh, there was a, a status report fit for the road. This was actually not one of our research projects. This was something from the Institute, Insurance Institute of Highway Safety, which AAA is a part of. Um, this was published in, in about five years ago, um, saying that senior drivers today are less likely to be in a crash, uh, which, which we kind of knew, but it's always nice to, to reaffirm that. Um, but what it specifically looked at it was comparing to 1997, uh, drivers 70 and older were three and a half times as likely uh, to be killed in a crash as drivers uh, aged 35 to 54. Uh, but by 2008, uh, that had declined to uh, 3.2 times. So kind of moving the needle, not a huge jump, uh, but certainly something to, to celebrate. Um, looking at drivers over age 70, there was an even greater difference. Um, going from 5.4 times more likely to be killed in a crash in 1970, or excuse me, 1997, compared to only 4.3 times as likely in 2008. So moving that needle, again, not necessarily looking at how many crashes they get into, uh, but whether they are able to survive those crashes or not. Uh, and that probably has a lot to do with features that became you know, standardized um, in vehicles, uh, as well as you know, features that may have been around for a while, but because older drivers are less likely to buy new vehicles, they'll, they'll hold on to them longer. Um, so the turnover rate, you know, took a while for uh, these features to end up in the vehicles that seniors were driving. And, but when they did, it, it paid off, and we started seeing the needle shift into a little more survivability. Uh, and then we also, uh, the, the project also noted uh, not only that vehicles are safer, but that seniors are generally healthier. Um, and that, you know, being healthier helps them survive these crashes more. The next year, uh, AAA put out another study uh, talking about looking at these conversations. Uh, these are extremely difficult conversations to have. I, I watched my parents have them with my grandparents, and now I've had to have them uh, with at least one of my parents. Um, looking at, you know, how do we handle this when, when younger Adult children have to talk to their parents, uh, which is the most typical situation. I mean, you do have situations where maybe it's a younger sibling talking to them or their physician or, or someone else or friend. Uh, but more often than not, you're talking about adult children talking to their aging parents about whether it's safe for them to drive or not. Uh, and what this study found is that healthcare providers were more of a trusted source. Um, kind of a natural dynamic. You know, older parents don't want to hear from their uh, even their adult children, who they still think of as children, that, you know, telling them, you're not safe to do this. That's not, you know, whether it's a pride thing or just a, a natural human dynamic, you know, they want to hear it for, from someone, out, you know, an outside observer, someone that maybe has some professional training in this. And, and healthcare providers were, were identified as one of the, um, excuse me, one of the, uh, the most trusted sources um, and, and would be most influential in terms of encouraging them to either change their driving habits or possibly consider transitioning away from driving altogether. Uh, many older drivers uh, during the, this study uh, spoke about, um, 
excuse me, um, the, their healthcare providers really more, more often than not validating what they already knew and, and maybe something that they've recognized themselves but they didn't really want to admit it or you know, they just wanted someone else to, to validate it um, so that way, again, it's not like they're admitting that they can't do something, but you know, it's a slightly different dynamic when, when someone else is telling them. Um, and that providers should be aware that not saying anything may have unintended consequences. Um, because we do see, as people lose their ability to drive, and, and as we'll talk about in a few minutes, it changes for, you know, it's different for everyone. Um, you know, the effects of aging can make you a less safe driver. Generally speaking, um, you know, painting in broad strokes, it doesn't, always, you know, it doesn't always do that or doesn't inherently do that, but for many people, um, the effects of aging can make them less safe behind the wheel. And simply letting them continue to drive um, has unintended consequences that, that puts them in danger and puts others in danger. Um, we also found that context matters in how open and receptive older drivers are in these conversations. Uh, looking at things like geographic location, you know, where are you having this conversation? Um, what are the cultural values uh, of the folks who are having this conversation? Um, what are the state regulations or, you know, local or state regulations that, that could be referenced, you know, um, you know, if, in terms of saying, well, it's not even just me saying this, it's, well, this is what the law says you should or shouldn't do. Uh, family involvement, you know, how, how involved are the adult children in their seniors' lives? You know, if they're living out of state and they only see them once a year for the holidays, uh, and then they come in for the holidays and say, hey, by the way, I noticed, you know, driving home from the airport, you weren't doing so hot, so maybe we should, you shouldn't be driving. Well, you know, who are you to base that off of one trip and, you know, that's I was having an off day or something like that. There's, it's just harder for people to take advice like that from someone who's not really a regular part of their life. Um, and then again, the healthcare setting. Uh, so, you know, the, the adult children, um, it was more likely that the aging parents would listen to them if maybe they came along to the healthcare appointment. And, and then it was, you know, the... the the family member and the healthcare provider kind of playing off of each other a little bit. And then it's best to have this conversation gradually. That was one of the other big things we found in that, is you can't just like have a big um, you know, intervention moment. It's not a recipe for success. There may be instances where just out of necessity you have to do that. Uh, but it's always best to try and begin laying the groundwork for that early. Uh, and that's one of the biggest recommendations that we've been making since this study came out is, again, not to keep just putting this off and putting this off until it becomes a crisis point, but having conversations early about, well, okay, you're still able to drive right now, and that's great, but let's start to think about what, what life is going to look like when that's not the case anymore or what kind of signs you know, w would indicate to you that maybe you're not uh, as safe as you used to be. So that you're laying those benchmarks down in advance um, and not just waiting for them to come up, you know, um, to, and, and leaving them in a position, and this is one of the scariest things and one of the biggest sources of resistance for seniors giving up their keys is not knowing how else they're going to get around. You know, they talk about that loss of mobility and there's some um, you know, cultural attachment to vehicles and, and the automobile um, in American culture that, that makes that in and of itself just difficult to give up that personal freedom of mobility that, that automobiles provide, but also just the basic fundamentals of I don't know how I would get anywhere. You know, I don't, I've never ridden the bus. I've always driven everywhere. I'm not familiar with the transit system or Uber. I've never taken an Uber. I don't even know how that works. I don't have a smartphone, you know just feeling like if you have that intervention point and you take their keys away, then they, they're stranded and, and, you know, get really anxious about that. So beginning to look at those alternative transportation options ahead of time um, is really, really important. Uh, we had another study. Um, this was a, a really interesting one uh, that we did in 2016 that looked at the issue, uh, the correlation between falls and driving. Um, and we, we hear a lot about falls. I know Wisconsin has a really um, robust 
uh, programming around falls through the, uh, the no, there's the no leaves should fall or the stepping on programs that are offered by uh, a lot of um, uh, area agencies on aging and different organizations. Um, we actually worked with, um, I, I'm totally blanking on their name, but there's a statewide, yes, yes, um, on, on some training or, or you know, presenting this, these studies to them or this research to them, but showing that having a history of falls um, indicates a significantly higher risk of being in a crash. And, you know, once you hear that, it kind of makes sense, but it's not one of those things that people necessarily put two and two together. Uh, but when you look at, uh, excuse me, it's not necessarily the case, uh, or always the case, that the fall itself has made you a less, or a less safe driver. It's not, not necessarily about the effects of the fall making you a, uh, at more at risk. It's whatever risk factors contributed to you having a fall are very similar to risk factors behind the wheel. You know, having less coordination, um, depth perception, or you know, just physical um, limitations that, that cut your reaction time down. Those are the things that contribute you know, to being more likely to be in a fall. They're also things that contribute to more likely being in a crash. So there's a, there is a very strong correlation. Um, so much older adults who had fallen were 40% more likely to experience a motor vehicle crash uh, than older adults who have not fallen. Uh, so we, we actually did um, you know, some partnering with the Stepping On specifically, uh, Stepping On program, because we identified that as a way that, hey, if we can help seniors avoid falls by helping them address the risk factors of falls, that's also helping them address these risk factors for, for crashes. Um, and we thought it was very successful, but unfortunately we you know, didn't do any like, follow-up research that was able to show us that you know, people who went through the Stepping On program um, were less likely to have crashes, but you know, we, we were able to justify it by saying you know, the Stepping On program in particular has a really great proven track record of helping people reduce falls, and it, we know that people who don't have falls are 40% less likely to be in crashes, then we know that stepping on is helping to prevent crashes, even if it's sort of secondhand indirectly. Um, so now, uh, well, does anyone have any questions before I move on to the next part about any of the research projects that we talked about? And, and all of these projects are available um, on our website, actually two, two different places on, online. One of them, I'll talk more in depthly about in a moment, we have our, our senior driving website, uh, but there's also a website for the AAA Foundation for Traffic Safety that has all of our research projects on it, and it's pretty easy. They just redid the website uh, uh, last year, um, and it's easy to search through you know, and, and identify um, projects that are specific to senior driving. They're, they're within our vulnerable road users category, and then you just scroll through and you can find the ones for seniors. Oh, sure. So for senior drivers, is there any potential research on seniors who drive every day versus a person who may drive once a month, twice a month. Is there any research that shows the difference between those groups? That's a good question. Um, I'm not off the top of my head aware of anything <coughs> specifically um, that, that looks at that question, um, but it does st stand to reason. I mean, we, we know with any skill, uh, and you know, we don't always think of driving as a skill, but, but that's what it is. And if you know, any skill you're using infrequently, um, you're probably going to lose that skill a little faster than if you were to keep regularly doing it. 